so many of us are out there in the world today and are wondering how is it that there's you know a good half of the population that are just stunningly terrified now when on the high wire and on a growing body of networks we're starting to see the science is there we know that this is not polio or smallpox even though alan dershowitz would like to make that comp you know that comparison you cannot make that comparison and we're saying to ourselves what's going on with our friends why is it they're so terrified why is it they are suffering from corona phobia well so many of you, so many of you have been writing in and asking, can we get some talking points? You've done, you know, three months of information. It's hard to put it all together. I'm going to, as quickly as I can, try and go through the top ten reasons that at least I personally am no longer on Team Coronaphobia. Let's see how this goes. Let's take it to the wall. All right, the number one, or actually the number ten. Let's start with ten. The number 10 reason I am off Team Coronaphobia is this. It's very simple. The initial model was dead wrong. Of course, we're talking about the Imperial model by Neil Ferguson. The Imperial model is what set us on this entire course. The entire world followed Neil Ferguson's approach towards modeling and where he said, 500,000 people could die in the UK. 2.2 million people could die in America. And so that's when we all freaked out big time and started locking down our states, locking down airlines, absolutely just saying we must shut everything down. Mass lockdowns, all of it happened because of this model, but it was dead wrong. Now we're hearing, I mean, first of all, he brought it down himself. He went from 500,000 deaths in the UK. Well, actually, maybe it's going to be more like 20,000 deaths. And we went down from 2.2 million to maybe 200,000 uh, could die in America. Those were gigantic shifts. That's not just kind of wrong. The difference between 20,000 and 500,000 in the UK is about 2,000 something percent off. Let me try and make this as clear as I possibly can, okay? Hold on. Imagine you're going on a road trip with your family, and you pull out the map and you chart your course based on the data you have in front of you and the roads you want to know. You know the beaches you want to visit, and you know all the campgrounds you're going to hit, and a couple of really nice hotels because your wife needs a shower once in a while. Well, you've got it all charted out, and you're cruising along, and then there's that night where all the kids fall asleep in the back of the car. And you're like, you know what? I could probably cut out another eight hours or so of driving while they're asleep. So you do it. You rock it out. Except there's only one problem. Oh. Whoops. What happened? I had it completely upside down. This is what happened with all of the modeling around the coronavirus. It was dead wrong, not partly wrong, like totally opposite land. And now, what have we done? What would you do if this was the case? Do you still think you're going to get to those same beaches and those same hotels and have all the same stops now that you realize you were going the exact opposite direction using the wrong data? No, of course you wouldn't do that. But that's exactly what mainstream media did. They just said, let's just keep on going down this course, even though the entire model has collapsed and is now dead wrong, nothing changed. And now we're hearing modeler Near Ferguson resigns, nicknamed Master of Disaster. And they're saying Neil Ferguson's imperial model could be the most devastating software mistake of all time. Of all time, folks. And yet, mainstream media, CNN, MSNBC, many of these networks, everyone you're listening to, they never changed their course. They stayed on the exact same course. How's that possible? I don't know, but that's why the number 10 reason I'm off of Team Coronaphobia is this model was dead wrong. Number nine, the lockdown failed. 
One of the things we know is when we look at all the charts from around the world, we know that the, the lockdown started too late. We've shown you this multiple times. When you really look at the fact that it takes two weeks for the infection to kick in, you realize that everyone had hit their peak. I mean everyone before they locked down. China did it, Italy did it, we did it. We were already at our peak. And then we have people, you know, there, there was the chart we showed you. COVID cases onset two weeks into incubation. You can see the lockdown came clearly after we were already peaked, which means everybody went into their homes with coronavirus already. We all just shed it all over each other, which is why Andrew Cuomo is freaking out, saying, I don't know why 66% of the cases now in hospitals of COVID-19 were locked down. I just don't understand. I don't understand what's going on. A shocking two-thirds of patients recently hospitalized in New York had been staying home. And then just this morning, a great article from Bloomberg looked at all of Europe and came to this conclusion. The results of Europe's lockdown experiment are in. And what they looked at is at the point of lockdown, it says in Europe, roughly three groups of countries emerge in terms of fatalities. One group, including the UK, the Netherlands, and Spain, experienced extremely high excess mortality. Another encompassing Sweden and Switzerland suffered many more deaths than usual, but significantly less than the first group. Finally, there were countries where deaths remained with a normal range, such as Greece and Germany. It goes on to say, yet the data show that the relative strictness of a country's containment measures had little bearing on its membership in any of the three groups above. While Germany had milder restrictions than Italy, it has been much more successful in containing the virus. And of course, there's Sweden. There's always Sweden, which makes all of this ridiculous. Sweden has now made it through. WHO is now louding the lockdown when they told everyone you shouldn't be paying attention. Now they are the model. Why? Because they didn't lock down. And this is the graph from that Bloomberg uh, article. Really fascinating. Who did worse? England and Italy and Spain. Sweden's right just, they're right at a little bit higher than normal. And so when you look at all these countries, it made no difference how strict you were or whether you locked down or not. But here's the elephant in the room. No one wants to talk about Sweden. Well, Sweden did have a higher death rate than normal. Yes, they did. But guess what? Sweden never has to worry about a relapse this fall. They don't have to worry about whether the vaccine gets here in time in 12 to 18 months. They don't have to worry about the destruction of their economy. Why? Because they achieved herd immunity, which was supposed to be the entire point of the lockdown. We weren't supposed to be locked down forever. We were just supposed to flatten the curve so that we could ease up the pressure on our hospitals while we allowed them to catch up. We let the disease spread slowly as it did in Sweden, and then we get to herd immunity and we're all good. But that changed, didn't it? They moved the goalposts. Now we're locked down until there's a vaccine, until there's absolutely no economy left, no one has a job, people are starving on the streets, people are attacking each other. So for all of those reasons, and especially because the lockdown is a total disaster, and by the way, they didn't even lock down the right people. We should have locked down the elderly, right? We should have locked down the nursing homes, but I'm going to get to that. Number nine, this is why I was off team coronaphobia. Number eight, here it is, nursing home neglect. Now, we're being told the entire point of what we're doing is to protect the elderly, right? But we didn't protect nursing homes. As we are now seeing in New York, and multiple governors are being questioned on this, why did you send sick people right into the nursing homes? In fact, wrote a law that said you are not allowed to turn away someone that's sick going into a nursing home. It does not take a genius, and we certainly can't make anyone a hero that went against the one piece of advice we all knew. Protect those that are over 65 that have other comorbid or other life-threatening illnesses. Instead, Cuomo represents a vast group of people that did the opposite. They didn't make the nursing home airtight. And then we have deaths that ran rampant. One-third of U.S. deaths are nursing homes. And one-fifth of New York deaths are in nursing homes. And what did we do? We didn't avoid herd immunity. We've been avoiding herd immunity with this entire lockdown. The whole time that we are fighting herd immunity, we are giving more time for the nursing home to be under threat. While you sit there with your masks and while you sit in your basements hiding, 
The virus is outside. It doesn't get eradicated by these measures. And if you think it does, you're not very smart. Everyone knows it's waiting outside the door. But every day it's waiting. It's looking at the cracks in your windows. It's looking at the next doorknob you're going to change. It's looking in the nurse home, nursing home saying, how can I get to grandma and grandpa? So while we delay manning up and stepping out as the 99% that will not be affected by this disease, we go out and get the cold then we can achieve herd immunity and actually protect those in the nursing homes. Oh, and by the way, while all this was going on, we took away, we said, past DNR notices saying we're not going to resuscitate you. See, team coronaphobia thinks it's a good idea to not resuscitate patients when they have a heart attack, so grandma and grandpa won't even be revived. For all of those reasons, I'm sorry I'm off of team Coronaphobia, that was number eight. Number seven, social distancing is unscientific. A brilliant article came out. We've been hearing scientists say over and over again, there's really no science behind social distancing. Well, where did it come from? Guess where it came from? A 14-year-old girl came up with social distancing as a part of a science project. This is an article that came out recently, the 2006 origins of the lockdown idea. But what is, uh, what is this mention of the high school daughter of 14? Her name is Laura M. Glass. Laura, with some guidance from her dad, devised a computer simulation that showed how people, family members, coworkers, students in schools, people in social situations interact. Her program showed that in a hypothetical town of 10,000 people, 5,000 would be infected during a pandemic if no measures were taken. But only 500 would be infected if the schools were closed. Well, you know, great science experiment. And by the way, Laura, congratulations for you of doing something and writing an idea that the entire world followed. But was it a good idea? Most scientists say no. Here is a recent article by a scientist. Two-meter social distancing rule was conjured out of nowhere, Professor claims. He goes on to say there's never been a scientific basis for two meters. It's kind of a rule of thumb. But it's not like there's a whole kind of rigorous scientific literature that is founded upon. But hey, let's go ahead and make the entire world do it anyway. Well, for those reasons, because it's actually not scientific, I am against social distancing, and that makes me against being on Team Coronaphobia. Number six, masks are a joke, folks. Masks are a joke. We've been over this. I know Matthew McConaughey may think that he's a hero in saving the world, just like someone in the military that's taking a bullet, but I'm sorry, Matthew, wearing the mask does not make you a hero. In fact, it kind of makes you question how intelligent you are. You only have to look at the box where most of us buy the mask, and it says this. This product is an ear loop mask. This product is not respiratory is not a respirator and will not provide any protection against COVID-19 or other viruses or contaminants. If that's what the mask is saying, can you imagine all these people that are tying like underwear around their face and, and scarves? What is that going to do for you? And when I think about it, let's be honest, for people that work on viruses in labs and are actually going to come in contact with one, they have to wear this, hazmat suits, absolutely sealed. They got to wash themselves down in the shower before they walk out. Do you think if masks works, wouldn't they prefer to wear that in a virus lab? Come on, folks, use your minds. But in case you just don't think that those are the points, or the fact that, you know, we've got Russell Blaylock put out a great article last week saying it's reducing the amount of oxygen you get in your blood. We have someone, my, my, um, one of the people that works here, Jennifer, her grandmother's in an old folks home right now, and she is wearing a mask everywhere she goes. She's in that risk group, and she is currently lowering her blood oxygen level, what happens to be the biggest danger of COVID-19 itself. Is she just jump-starting that problem? Could be. But look, if you still believe in masks and say, Dell, you don't know what you're talking about, and Matthew McConaughey says there's no science that says it's a bad idea, I guess they all think we can erase what happens in a video camera. Let me explain this. When a video camera is rolling on you and things come out of your mouth, they are there forever. You can't take them back, okay? So in case you ever have a video camera rolling, you may not want to say things like this. Well, with the scare of the coronavirus, many people have been running to the store to buy face masks similar to this one to protect themselves. Medical masks like this one cannot protect against the new coronavirus when used alone. Right now in the United States, people should not be walking around with masks. There's no reason to be walking around with a mask. 
When you're in the middle of an outbreak, wearing a mask might make people feel a little bit better and it might even block a, a droplet, but it's not providing the perfect protection that people think that it is. And often there are unintended consequences. People keep fiddling with the mask and they keep touching their face. Masks are really not necessary and they may actually be unhelpful. But don't get a false sense of security that that mask is protecting you exclusively from getting infected because there are other ways that you can get infected. WHO only recommends the use of masks in specific cases. And if you're not sick, you shouldn't be wearing a medical mask, but if you are, then you should. The people who are sick wear a mask. We recommend that people who are around someone who's COVID positive wear a mask, but do not recommend that the general public wears masks as a protective mechanism. If you do not have these symptoms, you do not have to wear masks because there is no evidence that they protect people who are not sick. You can find plenty of video of me saying exactly those things, and I'm proud of every moment I spent in front of a video camera saying it. Unfortunately for Fauci on the 60 Minutes, what do you do now? They all knew that was the truth. You're running around as a part of a charade now, thinking that there's something important you're doing to protect yourself. And for those people that are driving around like this, in your car, wearing a mask, I mean, come on. What do you think you're doing? What about the ton of steel and glass that's wrapped around you while you're in your car is not making you feel like you're protected. What is that little piece of fabric going to do for you? I'll tell you what it's going to do. It's going to make you a number one contender for the Darwin Awards. That's what I think is happening there. Anyway, moving on. That is number six. Max are a joke, and that's why I'm off team coronaphobia. Next, five. Blocked effective treatments. This is something that actually is quite dire. It's something that is really bothersome to me. When we look at what's happened in this country, we have talked over and over again about hydroxychloroquine, the fact that it works. Do you know that there are over 200 studies and trials around the world showing that hydroxychloroquine works. Remember, Vladimir Zelenko has now treated 699 patients with coronavirus with a 100% success rate. We have Didier Ryu just treated over 1,000 patients with chloroquine with a 99% success rate all around the world. And as we showed you, they did studies on SARS coronavirus all the way back in 2005, which we pointed out at the National Institute of Health. So Tony Fauci knows that hydroxychloroquine works even against SARS, a far more deadly version of coronavirus, which also, by the way, they recognized all the way back then was more of a blood issue, oxygen blood issue, than it was a respiratory illness. Yet if you watch mainstream media, or if you saw the great um, interviews by Cheryl Atkinson, meeting with doctors, the number one treatment in the world is hydroxychloroquine, yet everyone that watches liberal and mainstream media is terrified they're going to have a heart attack from hydroxychloroquine. It's becoming such an issue that they can't even get people to be a part of the trials for hydroxychloroquine. This is mind-blowing to me. Where was the fear of, of heart attacks when everyone was using it for malaria over the last 60 freaking years around the world? Where was the concern about heart attacks for those who had rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, both conditions that they have approved hydroxychloroquine? They didn't seem to care if you had lupus or, or rheumatoid arthritis that there was a heart murmur or a heart problem. Only when Donald Trump said... I think we have a really good product here. Trump says now he's taking hydroxychloroquine, the drug he touted as coronavirus treatment, despite FDA warnings. I mean, you can't knock that, right? And now they're attacking him. We have people saying, this is absolutely reckless that Donald Trump would say that he's taking hydroxychloroquine. Do I live in a fantasy world? Look, I've told you, I'm politically marooned. I was once a progressive liberal, now I really don't trust anybody. But I'll tell you what, if a general says to his army, you know what, I'm going to stand in front of you and I'm going to charge in the battle, I believe so much in this battle, I will lead you in with my own body. That used to be the most honorable thing you could do in the world. So anyone that's attacking the president for saying, hey, I'm taking it myself. I believe in it that much. All I have to say is, good on you, Mr. President. Way to lead. Way to put your money where your mouth is. Or in this fact, 
living by example. So for all those reasons, hydroxychloroquine, I would use it if I had to. Now, of course, before then, I'm going to take some vitamin C. I'm going to probably be high on my zinc, vitamin D, make sure I get lots of sun. And luckily, I don't have a medical license. They'll be taken away from me for saying those things because of this crazy world we live in. Doctors can't advise us to take more vitamins right now. Absolutely crazy world. But then let's look at, talk about effective treatments. What would have been effective is giving people oxygen. Since this was a blood illness where they are not carrying the oxygen correctly, instead we put them on ventilators. We denied them oxygen. We saw that their oxygen was low in their blood, but because the imperial model said 2.2 million people could die, we can't possibly give you oxygen because we might aerosolize this incredibly deadly disease. So instead, we put you in a coma while you looked us in the eyes and, we, and said, look, I feel pretty good. I just feel a little bit weak. It's all right. We're going to put you in a coma. We're going to ram a ventilator down your face. This is what it sounded like. The ventilator was the most important thing, remember? Let's never forget this. Let history never forget this was the conversation when all of this was starting. A major concern, ventilators have been in short supply across the country. Are there enough ventilators in this country? In a worst case scenario, ventilators would be one of the uh, choke points, if you will. It has become very severe. I was told the governor said we could run out of ventilators by midweek. The greatest critical need are ventilators. Where are they? Where are the ventilators? Nobody in their wildest dreams would have ever thought that we need tens of thousands of ventilators. In a worst case scenario, the U.S. need could be massive, up to 960,000 ventilators, a shortfall of roughly 790,000. We might need more like six, 700,000 to treat all the patients who are coming in. What am I going to do with 400 ventilators when I need 30,000? Ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We need more. They all need ventilators. We will look back on those statements and think they might as well have been saying guillotines, guillotines. We need more guillotines for COVID-19 because that's exactly what ventilators ended up being. They kill you. The reports all around the world, especially in New York or across the country, was nine out of ten people on ventilators died. This was not the right treatment. How many people did we kill using ventilators thinking that that was the answer when it took one doctor, just one doctor bold enough to leave a day in the ER, Dr. Cameron Kyle Seidel risked his entire career to say, we are doing something wrong. This does not appear to be an upper respiratory illness like you know, acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's much more like hypoxia, like they're up on top of Everest. We need to get oxygen to their blood. How would you do that? Oxygen, forced oxygen, not ventilators, not putting them in a coma. And when we think about his statement, that he was looking to the eyes of someone, a woman, I believe, who was talking to him. He said she was totally coherent. Usually when I'm about to put someone on a ventilator and into a coma, they're in an emergency situation. They cannot communicate, yet all of these patients are talking to me. They just have low blood oxygen, but they are fully coherent. I think they said they've even talked to people that were practically at zero with blood oxygen. Now we think about what was happening around the world. Are we now saying we took perfectly healthy people, walked us in, feeling a little lightheaded, I need some help here. Did we then say, great, we're not going to give you oxygen, we're going to wait till you start crashing, and then we're going to put you in a coma and ram a ventilator down your mouth. When I think about my neighbor who told me, I had a 35-year-old friend died within two days of the hospital, I'm going to have to say, I think they killed you because they didn't give you the right treatment. How many people died that were given hydroxychloroquine upon the moment they were diagnosed? How many people died that were given oxygen the moment they came in? Well, by the way, the National Institute of Health did change its protocol on that, and now they're advising maybe you should actually give oxygen and do everything you can to avoid ventilators. And if you really want to sort of question this, imagine if you knew all this information and you knew, you know what, ventilators are killing people. What if you were one of those people and you got COVID-19? What if you were a doctor? Would you say, hey, that's the protocol. Go ahead and bet me, babe. I know nine out of 10 chance I'm gonna die, but let's do that. No way. Listen to this doctor who actually got involved in his own treatment. This is fascinating. They recommended that I be intubated and I <laughs> almost literally begged not to be and said I was willing to sign a waiver. Mm -hmm. 
and ask them to sedate me and treat me with a mask. And if they absolutely needed to after that, to go ahead and intubate me. But if we could try that first, I would much prefer that as a patient. And they did so. And thankfully, I responded well to both, uh, you know, sedation and, and, and an oxygen mask. And then over the days, my lung capacity has increased greatly. And so mine went from dramatically low to normal levels over about three days of treatment with uh, oxygen. And I was downgraded from critical to non-critical in the COVID ward. Where would the death rate be had we treated this as a blood oxygen level like we knew it was all the way back during SARS? As Zach Bush pointed out in his interview, we knew all the way back then that there was not really a respiratory illness. It was a blood illness. We just need oxygen. We need to kill it, grabbing onto the, the hemoglobin, and we need to get more oxygen pumping through the body. The signs in 2003 had been ominous for those familiar with the medical history. SARS produced pneumonia in otherwise healthy adults, turning them blue before leaving them to drown in their own lung fluids. They were turning blue, and the last effect was the pneumonia, right, was the liquid. That was the last part. It's exactly what Kyle Seidel told us. Why did it take so long? And by the way, all the doctors that are being threatened for their license for giving intravenous vitamin C or using some hot sort of nebulizer or simply telling you, you know what, just like Dolores Cahill, one of the greatest scientists in our time said, you probably want to take some vitamin D right now. You should probably take some zinc and vitamin C. Those are good things to boost your immune system. Nobody's saying it's a cure. Why are you going after people's licenses? Anyone that does any one of these things, this is why, number five, I'm off your team, coronaphobia. Number four, doctors screwed up. This really sort of piggybacks on the last part, but it really points to something I want to be clear with you. When I worked on the doctor's television show, as a producer where I won an Emmy Award, I was there for six years. I have scrubbed into hundreds of surgeries, ORs. I had to put on all the equipment and I would go in with a camera and I would shoot the surgeries. And I watched amazing miracle workers do their job. I love great doctors and I love great scientists. But when we found the cutting edge doctors doing something no one had done before, dealing with a brain tumor in a way that did no harm, cut into no brain tissue, I would watch those doctors that were really the greatest miracle workers that I saw while working on that job. They were always under medical review. Their license was always attacked by their peers who wanted to stick with business as usual. In fact, when I'm asked, what did you learn from the doctor's television show? I would say that the science of medicine is one of the slowest moving animals on the planet. It is so hard to evolve because anybody that steps out and uses critical thinking and decides to do something in a new way, the pioneers, we assault the pioneers. We arrest the pioneers. We destroy the pioneers' credibility. It's not a movie. In the movies, they're like, oh yeah, they figured out how to create a new heart. It's not how it happens, folks. Just like Galileo and every other scientific development, you get attacked if you step out of line. And that's why doctors are screwing up. Because the hospital system is designed to stick to the protocol no matter what. How many doctors watch 9 out of 10 people being killed by ventilators who are speaking to them coherently in their office and are dead two days later? Why was there only one Kyle Seidel or a couple of nurses crying on videos saying, we are killing people in here? Why are you so used to as doctors just accepting this level of carnage? not giving hydroxychloroquine, even though your governor may be a Democrat and hates Donald Trump, don't you have the ability to say, I can read the studies from all over around the world, and by God, I'm going to use this product because it appears to work. And I'm going to give them oxygen because I know that's what they need. I'm not going to kill them with a ventilator. For all of these reasons, we have hospitals at half mass. We have doctors sticking to protocols that did not work. How high is the death rate because doctors screwed up. Only history will tell if we kept good enough records. I'm really wondering that. But because of this, number four, doctors are a big part of this problem. Unfortunately, I love them. But in this situation, you really didn't step up and use critical thinking. I'm off of team coronaphobia. We're getting there, folks. Number three, the vaccine is still a unicorn. All right. Previous attempts at coronavirus vaccines are plagued with issues. We have covered this extensively. Something I didn't really have time to get into with um, Mr. Dershowitz. Immunization with SARS coronavirus vaccines leads to pulmonary immunopathology on challenge with SARS virus. We've talked about this over and over again. 
every animal trial of a coronavirus vaccine up until this point had a caution at the end. It said caution proceeding to application of a SARS-CoV vaccine in humans is indicated. We need to be very careful because these animals got so sick. It reminded us of two children that died due an RSV vaccination attempt where they suffered the same thing. It's called antibody immune enhancement. It looks like you're healthy, like the eight people that have some antibodies right now over at Moderna. It's got everybody jumping up and down like they really won something. But the truth is, is that may be the first sign that they're on their way to getting really sick. Why? Because even though the animals had antibodies, they didn't seem to have a big reaction to the vaccine. The moment they came in contact with the actual virus in the challenge study, they overreacted. They had cytokine storm, upper respiratory, massive upper respiratory failure, you know, problems with lungs and other tissues and kidneys. It was a bad scene, okay? And now we're skipping animal trials. So the fact that we're all waiting and we're locking down, wearing masks, sitting in our houses saying, the way I'm going to protect my grandma is to wait for the vaccine unicorn to save us. Absolutely ridiculous. Could make it more deadly. We know that. If we end up being forced, as Alan Dershowitz once said, I'll be surprised if he really stands by that very strongly now, that he wanted to force this dangerous vaccine. Can you imagine if everyone got it and it ended up causing antibody immune enhancement, we would go from 0.1 to 0.3% from the actual illness to what about 20 or 30% death rate? More like smallpox or even worse, like Ebola. This is possible because of the vaccine unicorn. Long-term safety on vaccines, I already showed you that. We are not doing long-term studies. We have no idea what this is going to do for us. So anybody that is waiting and telling me, wear your mask and lock yourself down until the vaccine unicorn is found, I'm off of your Team coronaphobia. Number two, the death rate mirrors a bad flu. Now, I don't know why Alan Dershowitz says we really don't know what the death rate is. We all know what the death rate is. We have studies from USC now, Stanford, Germany, all around the world. The data is in. Millions of people have gotten the freaking disease now. If Deborah Birx is telling you we just don't have the data yet, I really wonder how capable she is of calculating what data actually is. If every country having this, Sweden already being thorough with herd immunity, along with Thailand and South Korea and other nations doing bad, other nations doing good, what data do you need? What we know is it's infectious. Asymptomatic carriers seem to be the norm, so 99% of you will have little to no symptoms at all, meaning you're going to recover and have no problem. Up to 99.75% of us should not be worried. There is no vaccine that has ever been as successful as the human immune system is with coronavirus. So if you're waiting and you think that you're going to die, the truth is, is we're at 0.1 to 0.3% based on all the models now from around the world, based on real data, not imaginary models, real data and testing that is being done. In, let's look at this. In 2017, the flu killed almost 80,000, and we didn't do anything about it. And we know now our numbers are being bloated. We have shown you that. We're paying more to list something as a coronavirus vaccine. I mean, a coronavirus. If you come in, you get paid about $13,000. If you put someone on a ventilator, you get another $39,000. All of this is bloating the amount of deaths. We're telling every doctor, no matter what they died of, really, if they died with coronavirus, say they died of coronavirus. Mark my words right now. Let me put this on camera in video. It's about to come out of my mouth. It's about to go on a video camera. I want to be able to reference the fact that I said this on this day right now. Mark my words. You will hear Deborah Burks and Anthony Fauci one day say, well, look, we can't call those all coronavirus deaths because there was comorbidities. They had other life-threatening illnesses they died from, and it was just listed as coronavirus. They died with coronavirus, but not from coronavirus. You're like, Dell, they will never say that. You want to bet? Here's why they're going to say it. America is still going like this. We are looking at having the worst death rate in the entire world. New York is one of the most deadly cities in the world. It failed harder than almost anywhere else in the world, which means someone's going to say, well, who was in charge? Why did America have such a high death rate if Anthony Fauci and Deborah Birx knew what they were doing? Especially since America was like one of the last ones to be hit by coronavirus. They had all that time to know what they needed to do, yet their death rate is through the roof. 
Well, I assure you, that will not bode well at that moment. And when they start getting heat with, why did you do such a bad job? They will tell you, we didn't. The numbers are bloated. In fact, if you look at Italy, which, which Deborah Birx said, we mirror Italy, they said, actually, the coronavirus deaths are about 12% of what we said they were. And if we took only 12% of death certificates have shown a direct causality from coronavirus. This is what Italy did. This is what we're going to do. Well, in the end, that's what we're going to recognize too. And if you take our death rate right now, which was right around 100,000, if it's really only 12%, one day we will recognize we had about 12,000 deaths at this period of time. They have bloated it, and it's going to backfire on them, and they are going to have to call it out. That's a mark my words. I can't wait to say, I told you so. All right, is that enough on that? The numbers are bloated. Moving on to number one. Here we go, the moment you've been waiting for. The cure is worse than the problem. My God, if this isn't clear. This is not just about economics. People say, well, it's just about your pocketbook. Donald Trump only cares about money when people are dying. You have to be an absolute imbecile to make that statement, okay? I'm sorry, I'm calling names. You're an imbecile if you think that letting our economy be destroyed is only about money, and the concern for that is only about money. We know that millions die if we have a lockdown. We have UNICEF and different groups all around the world saying millions that were on the poverty line, these children will now die around the world because of the lockdown. We also know that there are different models that say between 50,000, somewhere between 30 and 50,000 people die per one percentage point of increase in unemployment. Well, if we're talking about 20 to 30 percent unemployment, that means we may have over a million deaths here in America because of the lockdown. Compare a million deaths to our bloated number even of 100,000 deaths, or the 12,000 that we wink, wink, really know that it is, and you have a catastrophic mistake. As they've said all the way back at number 10, the imperial model was a catastrophic mathematical miscalculation. We never changed our course, and now we are destroying our economy, and millions and millions are going to have issues. We also know that millions are currently afraid to seek medical care or their doctor isn't even working because in the infinite minute wisdom of those suffering from coronaphobia, they said, let's cut half of the hospital staff. Let's get rid of heart doctors. Let's get rid of oncologists. Let's get rid of those appointments with check to see if you have diabetes. This has been all over the news if your eyes were open. People are so afraid of catching COVID, they're skipping treatments for things like heart attacks and strokes. And some Utahns are dying as a result. Visits to hospitals, clinics, and surgical centers has declined 60%. A new report finds that diagnostic panels and cancer screenings have fallen by as much as 68% since the beginning of the pandemic. We're seeing a lot more both deaths and comorbidities and illness as a result of people not seeking care. This time of year, the emergency room would normally see around 700 patients a day. But in the last three weeks, officials say they've seen half that number. Just a few days ago, a woman at St. Mark's died in a diabetic coma. They could have saved her had she just arrived sooner. According to the family, was just really hesitant to come in and get checked because she was afraid she might contract COVID. The study warns that the isolation and the anxiety from the lockdown may be responsible for as many as 75,000 drug overdoses and suicides over the next decade. If we didn't treat cancer patients for another six months, our calculations would be that something like 50 to 60,000 patients would die of cancer unnecessarily. Well, yesterday that showed the death toll has increased from 112 to 325 percent above baseline, and that's certainly a lot more than the coronavirus alone. One estimate says that over these three months, more than 80,000 cancers will be missed. Uh, because of lack of colonoscopy, prostate screening, and breast cancer screening. With the immunotherapy that's keeping his terminal cancer at bay now on hold, he's terrified he'll become one of the hidden victims of the coronavirus pandemic. We're going to be facing these deaths of despair as we go forward. It may get really bad. And there you have it. Those are the top 10 reasons that I am off of Team Coronaphobia. If you like that clip, then be sure to check out our live broadcast of The High Wire every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Pacific Time. 
You can watch it on Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, and Twitter. We'll see you there.